Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? I begin nearly all of my talks and speeches with my glasses that can see <laughs> and with a song because music brings an audience into a shared psychological space. You're all here physically, and for that, I am deeply grateful. And now, I invite you to truly enter the Performing Arts Center as an active listener. Or better yet, as a listening activist. How about that? <laughs> I humbly ask you, to be fully present in order to absorb everything that I have prepared to say this morning. And my greatest hope is that my words will be fuel and my love for CA. Oh, do I love this place. I want my love for CA to be the oxidizer so that when the fuel and the oxidizer are mixed together, this talk will be the propellant for a day of deep engagement and personal reflection. And since I am the mother of a teenager, I am fully aware that the true measure of my success this morning will be whether or not my words shake you, amazing and recently rolled out of bed, teenagers out of your sleep, literally and figuratively. May the words that I speak take root and take up residence and space in your hearts and remain here with you long after I have departed. And with that invocation, let us begin this talk, which I have titled, Lost and Found. We start with the fundamental truth, which is this. Dr. King believed that in order to create a just society, one needed to ensure that no person is ever lost or invisible. In a diverse community striving for equity, does that phrase sound familiar? Does that phrase sound familiar? OK, I'm the daughter of a Pentecostal preacher. Let me just stop and say that. So I'm really good with people talking back. If you hear someone or something that makes you feel a spirit of engagement, or if you feel that you agree with what I'm saying, I'm really good with you saying amen. I'm really good with the hand. I'm really good with the snap. Are we good with that? Oh, I'm from Brooklyn. Anybody else from Brooklyn? There we go, my people. All right. So in a diverse community that is striving for equity, people work tirelessly to make sure that there aren't categories of the visible people and the invisible people, the lost people and the found people. When there is a beloved community, People are not divided into hosts and guests. Now, I haven't been at CA as a trustee in a long time, but I hope the same is true now of what was true then, which is that the day students were not hosting the boarders, that the boarding students were not hosting the day students. You all lay claim to this space and this school. When there is a diverse community striving for equity, you become the light in the darkness. And you don't hesitate to use your power and your privilege to amplify the voice of someone who is being silenced. So I send four questions that comprise the first verse of? From? Thank you. We are in the PHC. Thank you. <laughs> The song is called You Will Be Found from the musical Dear Evan Hansen. And it is a beautiful and a painful story about parenting and communicating and facing the truth and seeing people from the inside out. It's about a community decomposing and a coalition called the Connor Project. 
I'll be a misguided, it's about that coalition forming. And here are the opening questions again. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear, like you could fall and no one would hear? I ask you this morning to have a courageous conversation with yourself. Ask yourself the question, have you ever felt lost or invisible, alone in a crowd, on the margin in a place filled with people? Do people who should know you quite well by now call you by the wrong name because you look a whole lot like someone else, but not really? Are you frequently misgendered as you walk through the world? Do people assume that you and your family have more or less money than you actually do? Perhaps your loved ones forget that you have a learning difference or a physical disability that needs to be accommodated. Do you struggle to be seen? In 1968, the city of Memphis was filled with invisible people, black sanitation workers. They were paid $1.25 per day for a nine-hour day. They were not allowed to use the available showers to wash the putrid smell of garbage from their clothes and their bodies at quitting time. Many of the sanitation workers walked home instead of riding the bus because the stench of garbage on their clothing was so off-putting to fellow passengers. The labor union that the sanitation workers organized was not recognized by the mayor of Memphis. The garbage collection trucks were old they were malfunctioning. In fact, on February 1st, 1968, I was three weeks old at the time, tragedy struck two black sanitation workers. I wonder if you know their names. Is there anyone under the sound of my voice who knows the names of the two black sanitation workers who were killed on February 1st 1968. They were invisible, and they remain invisible to us unless we say their names. Echo Cole, Echo Cole. Robert, Walker. Robert Walker. They were seated on the back of the garbage truck at the end of a very long work day. The trash compactor was the only place to ride. The trash compactor switched on by accident, and the two workers were crushed in the back of the truck, just like garbage. There was no public outcry, but we <coughs> say their names again now. Echo Cole. Echo Cole. Robert, Walker. Robert Walker. They were invisible, and there was no breaking story on February 1st for these two men. In fact, the big news story that day focused on a famous singer named Elvis Presley. Now, I don't have a lot against Elvis. I was born on his birthday, and well, maybe there's another speech I have about his cultural appropriation, but that's, that's for another time. But I will tell you that on February 1st, Elvis Presley and his wife Priscilla Presley celebrated the birth of their first and only child. Anyone know her name? Lisa Marie Presley. Now, 25 years later, Lisa Marie marries Michael Jackson, but again, that too is a speech for another time. <laughs> but the news stories were about the birth of Elvis Presley's first child. On February 1st, People did not talk about Echo Cole or Robert Walker. But I've now given you their names and they are no longer invisible to you. The death of these two sanitation workers was what compelled the sanitation workers as a whole to strike 11 days later. And the strike itself is what caused Dr. King to come to Memphis. 
He knew that if he went there to link arms with them and to lead nonviolent protests, that he would call attention to the indignities that the men were facing. Dr. King knew that if he delivered a speech decrying the plight of the workers, his powerful voice would amplify theirs. Remember, in the beginning, I said, in a beloved community, in a community that is diverse and striving for equity, we use our power and our privilege to amplify the voices of others. We ensure that no one person is lost or invisible. Martin Luther King used his position to capture the attention of the local government and its leaders. Now let me pause at this moment for an important sidebar because I've used the words power and privilege a few times. Dr. King, like most people, was a member of both privileged and marginalized groups. I'll say it again. Dr. King, like most people, was a member of privileged and marginalized groups. His skin color made him and his family the object of hateful bias. And he, without question, suffered under the systemic oppression against African American people. And yet, Dr. King's elite education, his gender, his Christian faith, and his sexual orientation made him a part of dominant groups. Yes? Okay. Do you know the name Bayard Rustin? He was arguably as dedicated and skilled in leadership as Dr. King, yet because he was a gay man, he was largely hidden from view. If you don't know the name Byron Rustin, watch a wonderful film called Brother Outsider to learn more about him. And like King, you are all a part of privileged and oppressed groups. And how do I know that? Because you're all connected to this extraordinary place. Concord Academy, and when this school is named on your resume or on your high school diploma, it gives you tremendous social capital. Would you agree? <laughs> Seniors, when the last person receives the commencement sock, good luck with that. <laughs> you will all have received a large dose of privilege. My family received financial assistance, which allowed me to attend an incredible girls' school in New York City called Chapin. But my diploma did not have a price tag on it when it was handed to me in 1985. So no matter where you've come from, and I know this school has students in it from all over the country and all over the world, no matter where you come from, you have landed here in this diverse community that is striving for equity and justice. And that means that you are privileged. OK, my sidebar is done. Back to the sanitation workers. The strike begins on February 12th. How instructive is it that the signs that the sanitation workers wore did not say, we seek better working conditions, or we want higher pay? Does anyone know what those sanitation workers' signs said? You often see them in films. March. Yes, I am a man. These four words were a public outcry by each individual declaring, I'm a real person. I have dignity. I have worth. I matter. I walked in this morning, and you know, it's so interesting what your eyes catch. I think I counted no, more, no less than four Black Lives Matter signs in windows and on walls. Courtney, is that your? Yeah, I believe that's your name. She has a sweatshirt on. Where is she? Does it say, it, it says Black Lives Matter? I saw you. I saw that. I saw me in you. Thank you for that. It's so easy to walk into a space and feel invisible and someone through signs and language can say, I see you. I am Wanda, I am a woman, I am a school leader, I am here, and I matter. We all recognize that this deeply racist mindset that black people aren't truly people is deeply rooted in centuries of slavery where captured Africans were deemed property to be bought and sold. 
during the 1787 United States Constitutional Convention, when the states were trying to form the more perfect union, the Three-Fifths Compromise asserted that enslaved people were 60% of the value of a white person for the purposes of taxation and representation. And with that mentality carried over from slavery to segregation and Jim Crow laws to mass incarceration today, I heard there's going to be a workshop on mass incarceration today, yes? Because that is the evolution of slavery. Slavery didn't end, it just evolved, yes? OK. So glad you're talking about it. I should have canceled my plane to go home tomorrow, because I would stay. It is no wonder that we are still chanting Black Lives Matter. Because for King and so many others, this was not simply an economic strike. It was a quest for respect and dignity to go from being lost to being found. King leveraged his power and his resources to support the striking workers. And he arrives in Memphis in mid-March to support the strike in a peaceful protest. Unfortunately, a snowstorm. You know what that's like, but you have to go to school anyway most of the time in New England. But a snowstorm delayed the march, and then it was held later on March 28th. Thousands of students, which I'm not suggesting they do this, but thousands of students, students skipped class in order to attend the march. Unfortunately, silence ensued, and a 16-year-old named Larry Payne, let's make him visible, Larry Payne. Larry Payne. He was killed that day by the Memphis police. Many other strikers and allies were assaulted with tear gas and clubs. And Dr. King ultimately left Memphis for a few days to do some work. He promised that he would return. And many people said to him, do not go back. It's dangerous. How many of you know that DEI work can be dangerous? It can be all together scary as you stand on the edge, trying to render people visible. But we all, we all know that King returned to Memphis on April 3rd. He wanted to show his solidarity. And he delivered what would be his final exhortation, which we now refer to as the I've been to the mountaintop speech. And again, we all know that the very next day, he was assassinated at the Lorraine Hotel. I believe that all forms of bias and oppression, race-based or otherwise, have the same ugly root, invisibility. If I do not see you, if you are lost to me and I to you, if I deny your existence, if I fail to acknowledge your presence and your personhood, if I keep you at bay by only familiarizing myself with the general ideas associated with the groups to which you belong, rather than the particular stories that are yours alone, then I have given myself permission to withhold respect from you. By power, I've given myself permission to delay your civil rights, to treat you poorly, or ignore you all together. That is why visibility and naming people and seeing them are so important. Because if I don't see you, if I choose not to see you, or if I just don't see you, I'm not really concerned about you being in the community. Now, I'm a poet as well as a singer, even though it's early in the morning for me. Um, but I hope that those words of Dear Evan Hansen, if you haven't seen it, I don't know where it is in the world, but I want you to go back or just get on you know, your um, Google today and just look it up and listen to the whole song because the part of the song that makes my spirit soar is the moment when the cast starts to sing, you are not alone. And then, you are not alone, you are not alone. And oh, it just, I direct a gospel choir in college too, so I, I just love our rhythm and blues and gospel music, and there's that moment when the cast is saying, I see you. Langston Hughes, so many years earlier, 1926, said, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. 
Tomorrow, I will be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. Who's in the kitchen? Who's at the table? Who's in the kitchen, CA? Who's at the table? Now let me be clear, rendering someone invisible is not always a deliberate act. I am not here to accuse. I'm an educator who asks questions. So I don't want anyone here to take yourself off the hook right now by saying, oh, I would never ignore anyone. I see everyone. I'm a good person. I'm not a racist. I respect everyone. The color of someone's skin doesn't matter one bit to me. I treat everyone the same. There are a lot of good people in the world. My dear friend Dolly is the author of a book called The Person You Mean to Be. And you know she says that the danger of diversity, equity, and inclusion are all the good people who think they're already finished with the work. Often, the woke people are the worst perpetrators of microaggressions and the perpetuators of bias. I'll tell you a story about myself to tell you humbly that even despite our best intentions, in spite of them, we often make mistakes and render people invisible. I I am a graduate, a very proud graduate of Columbia University. And I attended Columbia just as Columbia was integrating girls. I love CA because of its all girls' roots. I know you don't remember it because you weren't even born in 1971. But this school has at its heart a dedication to girls and women. Columbia had a deep dedication to men until the 1980s. And in class, and I know this is true of none of you male identifying students, but the male identifying students at Columbia really were kind of filled with themselves, a sense of importance in class. And you know, I came all fired up from Brooklyn and from Chapin, so I was ready to go. <laughs> and in class, there was one particular boy named Marcus. And he would stretch every time he had a question. So you knew his hand was coming. Like he was like, you know, like doing deep knee bends, like like that required, you know, the question asking. And Marcus would stretch, and this is how he would ask every question. Professor, might I ask another interesting question? And the girls were like, seriously, is he real? Is he for real right now? Like it was awful. But that is now the stretch, the question. And we were in Professor Borowski's class. I loved and still love philosophy. And we were studying free will and responsibility. In fact, that was the name of the course. And Professor Borowski was having a debate. Half the class said an addict has free will. And the other half of the class was arguing that an addict does not have free will. Okay? So we're going at it. You know, the addict has free will because at the moment of sobriety in the beginning, the person was not addicted, so that's a choice. So anything that follows from the addiction is his or her fault or their fault. And blah, 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 blah. The addict is not responsible because the addict has a physical compulsion, and blah, 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 blah. it's a disease, and we are at it. And Marcus is on one side and I'm on the other. And I was like, come on, let's go. Because we, I am not going to lose this argument. And as I am arguing with Marcus, I feel the urge in my bladder. I'm like, oh, man, I have to go to the bathroom. And so I'm in class and I'm like, Lord, arguing. I'm like doing my little dances. And, and I thought to myself, what would be more embarrassing? Losing the argument or having an accident at age 18. I, I just thought, what should I have done? Go to the bathroom or argue? What do you think I did? I went to the bathroom. <laughs> so I went, to, I go to the bathroom and I zoom into the bathroom and I go to the bathroom, I wash my hands, I fling open the door. 
door, and as I open the door, I hear this voice. The voice is razor sharp. The voice sounds like fire, and it feels like a knife in the back. And this voice says to me, who the hell do you think you are? You walk into this bathroom in this ivy tower, and you don't see me? Turn around, and there's a black woman in a cleaning dress. In her hand is a toilet brush. I tell you this morning, CA, I did not see her. She thought that I intentionally ignored her. She had no idea who Marcus was. She didn't know that I was running back to class. And I froze. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She looked like my grandmother. I'm first generation college. How many of you are going to be the first person in your family to go to college? Raise your hand high, that's a good thing. Okay. I know people who look like her. I knew people who washed other people's clothing and cleaned other people's houses. Had I seen her, I would have said, good afternoon, but I did not see her. So I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I run back to class, I win the argument against Marcus and his crew. I get a great grade in the class from Bernard Borowski, my professor. And yet, at the end of the term, the cleaning woman's voice and her face stayed with me. I wound up writing a personal essay about her and submitting it as my personal essay for graduate school. And as a result of that essay, a pharmaceutical company interested in investing in graduate schools of color paid for my entire graduate school degree. I have that woman to thank because I did not have to take out a loan for graduate school. I wish that I could see her and thank her. I tell you that story because it is easy to walk by people that are right in front of you. And I hope that throughout the day today and in the days to come, that you find yourself not only more boldly declaring who you are, but also making space to see <laughs> others. So who remembers the title of this talk? Lost in so let's pivot to found. I'm looking here at a question. I'm going to ask you, what happens when individuals and communities find each other? Here's my favorite quotation by Dr. King. We are caught, who knows what I'm about to say, in an inescapable network of mutuality. Love it. Say it again. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of dignity, excuse me, of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. Isn't that beautiful? I am what I ought to be because you find me because you connect to me. King asserts that our best shot at maximizing our own potential and thereby transforming our world is to find each other and then get to work. When warned about the danger of returning to Memphis, 
King said this, the question is not, if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That is the question, he said. You know, when it comes to empathy, CA, you are way ahead of the game. And here's why I say that. Because this is a school built on stories. What other school has a Baptist meeting house converted into a chapel that, I remember I was on the board when the chapel was redone. It was this whole story about they found wood under the water and dried it out, the same kind of wood that, I mean, there's so many beautiful stories about the places and spaces on your campus where you tell stories. Stories create empathy. And I'll say a little bit more because there's some things that empathy is not. But the very act of telling your story, do you still make signs on someone's chapel day? That says, I see you. You're on your way in. Your voice will be the voice I listened to this morning. Day after day, you are fed with each other's stories and it hopefully softens your heart and opens you to your peers and to the adults that love you so much. You have the currency of each other's stories. We're also in the Performing Arts Center. One of my favorite things about CA is the performing arts. Oh my gosh, I, I sat in this room so many days looking at performances. I was asking Peter, what was the, what was the show this fall? And he said, Midsummer Night's Dream. I said, oh, whose fuck is fucking here? Yeah. I, I so love what happens in this space. Amy Spencer, I'm just gonna shout you out. I, don't, I can't see you, but boy, oh boy, you have given so much to this school. I also was just taken in by Shelly. I don't know if you're here, Shelly Bowman, as I was reading the CA magazine. I read everything. I, I, I'm a stalker, I think. Maybe I'll be a stalker forever. And I was looking at the half masks. Anyone in that class where you put that half mask on? And Shelly said, it requires empathy for the mask. It's not just a mask you put on your entire face, you have to figure out how you fit with it. Again, the performing arts, whether it's a dance or a play or just a song, requires deep empathy. Rick talks about the boundless campus. I know you talk about it as a geographic metaphor, right? But, but I like it as an emotional metaphor as well. What if CA, we're known for being emotionally boundless. What if you were known for how deeply you love and for how closely you listen to each other? And since you had Shakespeare, I'm gonna give you a little more. Remember Juliet on the balcony? She says, my bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have. There it is again. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. The more I give, the more I have, the more I see you, the more I am seen, the more I search for the lost, the more found. This sounds so cheesy, but I thought, what if Concord Academy were famous for its Concord? It's harmony, it's agreement. There's that word that used to be in your old mission statement, it's covenant between people. What if you were emotionally boundless? So let me say a few words about empathy, and I hope I'm still with you. So proximity is not sufficient for empathy. So just because you show up at the chapel to listen, that's not empathy, okay? It just 
want to disabuse you of that notion. Being there is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient for empathy. And let me share a story with you about Park School that illustrates the point. Any Park School alums here? Hi. <laughs> hey there. This is not about, it's not about casting aspersions on Park. I loved it. I was there for 11 years. But here's something that happened when I was the middle school division there, division head there. So there was a day when some of the teachers and students decided to engage in a service project in a nearby community. And the goal was to clean up trash in a large vacant lot that had become an eyesore for passers-by and neighbors. And so one afternoon, a bunch of middle school students and teachers from the park, we armed with you know, large garbage bags and pitchforks, loaded a big yellow school bus. Now, all the yellow school buses at Park had the Park School written across. So it was not a, a, you know, uh, a secret who was showing up in this neighborhood. I decided to get out of the office that day and add myself to the group of chaperones. We get to the adjacent neighborhood, and the students hop off the bus, and we get right to work. Pitchforks on the ground, picking up trash, cleaning up this big, beautiful, vacant lot. And during the hour or so of work, I noticed that the residents in the neighborhood were looking out of their apartment windows with frowns on their faces. One woman actually came outside and started picking up trash with us. Her body language was really clear. And if her body could speak, it would have said, look, I would have come outside to do this work if you had just asked me. She was clearly not happy with us. And when the work was over and the students boarded the bus, I heard one of the middle school students say, whew, that was hard work. The lot looks better. But thank goodness we don't live here. My heart was broken. We had made a colossal mistake. We made that mistake with the best of intentions. We thought that getting proximate was all we needed to do. How many of you know who Brian Stevenson is? Just Mercy in theaters near you, or maybe not near you, in Boston, um, somewhere close. But, um, he talks about the importance of proximity, but it alone is not sufficient for empathy. We saw a need, we took action, we cared. But I have not emphasized respect and reciprocity and empathy and mutuality in this service endeavor. There were students at our school who lived in that neighborhood. And what messages did we send them that day? Moreover, what did the neighbors truly need from us? Did we even take the time to ask ahead of time, what do you need? I learned a lot that day. As a young leader, I became the head of the middle school at Chapin when I was 29, excuse me, at, at Park when I was 29 years old. So I was young and ready to change the world, but still learning. And I'm 52 and I am still learning. It is still messy work and I still make mistakes. But my goal is to be a person who not only gets close to others that are unlike me, but really asks them, what do you need from me? What would you have me to do? And sometimes the answer is nothing. And sometimes the answer is something. At Hamlin, service begins after we fully understand what the unmet needs are, and then we partner with people and organizations to figure out the best ways to repair the world. When Hamlin girls finish a service project, they don't say, phew, thank goodness that's not me. What they say is, wow. That is me. My humanity is inextricably linked to theirs. And that respectful, reciprocal partnership between organizations, it's fantastic. I like it. But what has been even more effective is harnessing the power of both groups to build a coalition. I know that's a word you're going to be talking about a lot today. 
And when we cultivate empathy, we are preparing for coalition building. I particularly like this definition of a coalition. A coalition is an organization of diverse interest groups that join their human and material resources to produce a specific change that they are unable to deliver as independent individuals or separate organizations. Isn't that a great definition? That when you put diverse groups together, one of my favorite things that happened today is a friend of mine who's a, um, a Jewish man, he goes to a church service at a Baptist church and they have service together, the Jews from his temple and the uh, Baptists from the church. They go to church together to talk about Dr. King. And then the next year, the Baptist folks go over to the synagogue and they have service together. Boy, the music and the talking and the food. That, how many my Jewish friends out there? My mom uh, went to um, Jewish nursing school. That was the name of it, Brooklyn Jewish Nursing School. And so I sat around tables as a child Sanders eating the best brisket, mm, Lord. And the, when my mom was dying, what she wanted more than anything was chicken matzo ball soup. And I just would crush the matzo and just put it on the tip of her tongue. She grew up in the company of people who were not like her. Let me tell you, when the Jewish nurses and the black nurses got together because they needed something to change in nursing school, things changed. It's a coalition. They are able to produce a specific change that they are unable to deliver as independent individuals or separate organizations. I believe that Dr. King would want independent schools like CA and Hamlin and Park to push social action into the sphere of social justice. Yeah, you see that, not that art? From social action to social justice. Social justice is the idea that resources and respect should be distributed across groups regardless of the social identifiers of race or class or gender identity or sexual orientation or religion or national origin. Social justice is the deeply held understanding that all people share a common humanity. Remember the sandwich signs, I am a man. If we are all human beings, then we are all entitled to fair treatment under the law, unwavering support for our human rights, and equal access to resources. And when one group sees another group that is being alienated, marginalized, targeted, or denied their basic rights, they can combine resources to bring about the needed change. I love it when I'm in a division meeting or an all employees meeting at Hamlin. When something is happening in the world, particularly in the LGBTQ community, in our city of San Francisco, I love it when straight people are outraged. When something is happening to black people, I love it when people who are not black are outraged by it. Those coalitions mean something, and they matter greatly. I do want to make sure you also know that joining forces with like-minded people, that's not empathy either. A lot of people say, I have empathy. Remember the first instance, I have empathy because I'm there. Remember proximity is not empathy, it takes more. And then some people say, well, I have empathy because all the people around me agree with me. I think a lot of the polarization in our world right now is not a consequence of the lack of empathy. I think the polarization is a byproduct of the ways in which we let bias marry empathy. Does that make sense? If you only hang out with the people that believe what you believe, that's an easy life. You don't challenge yourself. You don't test yourself. I tell the girls at Hamlin that you are being intellectually lazy if you don't argue the other side of an issue. You 
you need to do this, you can go la 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 la, that's intellectually lazy. But if you really want to engage in civil discourse, you need to understand the other side, even if you vehemently disagree. So when you are only around people who are like you, when the mirror neurons mimic the people who are like you, and then you just hang out together, the birds of a feather flocking together, that is not empathy. And so I challenge you, this is beautiful phrase in your mission statement that says cultivating empathy, that empathy is not agreeing with people who believe what you believe or who will vote the way you vote. Real empathy and pushing yourself to understand what it feels like to be in the shoes of another, it requires you challenging your very own views. It's easy to form coalitions with people and organizations that in some way mirror you and support ideas that connect to your own experience. My um, brother-in-law is a US Marine, and not until he married my sister did I have much to say about the military. I, did, I had lots of deep thoughts about who was fighting, where, and why. And I wasn't thrilled at first when my sister told me she was dating a Marine. And yet, I learned a whole lot sitting with him around the Thanksgiving table. He's now a veteran. I understand veterans' rights more now. Boy, was it hard. There's some days I just wanted to take my cornbread sausage stuffing and just fling it at him. But he challenged me, and my empathy grew because he was at my table, as opposed to in my kitchen. The last thing I want to say about cultivating empathy is that empathy is a means and not an end in and of itself. Empathy must lead to action and solidarity and transformation of a community. As such, empathy is a skill. It's not simply a value. So remember, and I said the school is already far ahead because you sit in this beautiful chapel and you hear stories. Well, just sitting there and listening is not empathy. What happens is you are actually learning how to listen and then hopefully how to act differently once you leave the chapel. If those stories, after you've listened to them, don't change you, then it's just an exercise in entertainment. That chapel is not for entertainment. It's for social justice. It's for community building. It's for coalition building. Empathy is a skill. It leads from listening to action. I'm going to show you a very quick video. So I have a dear friend named Courtney Cogburn. She is a professor at Columbia in the School of Social Work. And she calls her research transdisciplinary research. She is working on combating racism using technology, public health, history, and literature, and psychology. She's amazing. She was at my house last week, and she was at my school last week, because she has developed something called 1,000 Cuts. It's a virtual reality experience. Um, and I have never done anything with virtual reality. Um, but you'll see in this video, it's a very quick video, um, there's a whole you know, head apparatus, eyes, ears. And what she's done is she's created an experience so that you step into the shoes of a black boy who grows into a black male adult. And his name is Michael Sterling. Why does that name ring true or interesting to you? Michael Sterling. No? I'll give you a hint. It's a combination of two names. Good job. Can everyone hear you? What's your name? Hi, Nancy. Say it louder. Alton Sterling and Michael Brown. 
that we know. Yes? About at least one thousand? Yes. So Michael Sterling is the little boy. And Courtney has came to an experience where you become Michael in lower school, and then you're Michael as a teenager, and she uses data about stop and frisks in New York, and you become Michael being stopped and frisked by the police, and then you become Michael as an adult who is sitting in the lobby of a company where you are going for an interview. You're not going to see all of that because I'm the person experiencing the virtual reality experience. But I had um, the director of communication at Hamlet just take me a little. You can just see a little bit of what I was doing. So this is my office at Hamlet. in the street at the virtual reality studio. And they're screaming at me as what you can't hear, and I have to get down on my knees and raise my hand. It's petrifying. So that's right after. Stop and frisk. I'm the mother of two um, African American boys. I'm married to a black man. My son David is a ninth grader. He looks like a man. I'm scared a lot. When he wants to ride the, it's called BART, um, the subway, the T, um, I, I have never been so petrified. I will just be very honest with you. And so as I was a teenager, and so what you can't tell is that um, the clickers that I have in my hand are my hands in the virtual reality experience. And it's very cool. I had a phone in the virtual reality experience that I could answer. In the virtual reality experience, the, the mom is saying to Michael Sterling as a teen, put your hood down. Don't wear that. You should hear me. I, one of my biggest arguments I had with David, my son, is why he can't wear his hood up. Why he can't wait, he wants to wear a do-rag. My God, I'm like, do you know what a do-rag is? Mm -hmm. like, it's this kind of scar thing. He's, he's like, Mom, you know, you're getting seasick because of my waves. I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's kind of a cool dude. And um, I know. I wanted him to go to C.A. Rick. Like, I really, really did. But he's gotten in that California mode. Um, but I will tell you, that when I was Michael Sterling as the, uh, the teenager and I was being told to put on the ground, now what you can't also see is that Michael was hanging out 
with three of his white friends in the street, and they're just all going to play a basketball game, and he's the only one that three police officers confront. And they're standing, the, the white teenagers in the reality experience are standing there petrified, not knowing what to do, and you, have, you literally have to get on the ground. Now you saw the chair, because I'm old and my knees you know, hurt, but, but I did, you know, I immediately got down, and they're measuring, that they've done this with thousands and thousands of people. And what they do is they measure people's responses and they track them because sometimes the impact of what you're learning here doesn't show up until later when you're reading a news story or when you're interacting with someone else. Um, what Courtney is after is not just awareness. And I'm not saying awareness is bad, but remember, empathy is not just a value, it's a skill that's supposed to lead to social change. So what Courtney is hoping is that through the virtual reality experience, that you, over time, become more willing to be an anti-racist. Does that make sense? Some people are like, I'm not racist. I, I, I'm good with that. But I want you to be anti-racist. How about that? You see the difference? People are like, I'm not this, I'm not that. Great. But are you actively working with me in coalition to dismantle the systems of oppression? Are you actively interrogating your own biases so that you see people and treat them well? I love the word accomplice. We used to talk about allies, and um, one of my team members introduced the word accomplice. And I was like, well, that have a negative connotation. And she said, no, Wanda, an accomplice is someone who's willing to take action on your behalf. So an ally is like, no, but, a, but an ally might not be willing to go to the march with you or go to the teacher with you to say something happened in class that didn't feel so good. So let's strive to be more than just active, listening, caring people. Let's strive to tear down the systems that oppress people. That's what I'm about. So I'm going to end, because it's getting to be that time, with a Mary Oliver poem, because I love Mary Oliver. And she has a poem called Song of the Builders, and it's about building bit by bit, because this work doesn't happen overnight. And this one day in your school year only matters if you keep going. Again, that virtual reality experience only matters if the people who experience it do something differently. The third scene after the stop and frisk is Michael Sterling as a grown-up, and he's getting uh, ready to stand up to greet the uh, gentleman who has come to interview him. And Michael Sterling, in the uh, 1,000 Cuts journey, went to Yale. Oh, and, and he has his resume, and he's literally sitting, or you are sitting as Michael, in the lobby, and the employer goes to a white man who's sitting next to you and says, hi, Michael, and they start talking about Yale. And he's sitting, and you're sitting there as Michael, and you're like, hey, what the heck? Like, I'm over here, and the employer interviews the other person before you, even after he realizes, oh, oh, you're not, Oh, you're not Michael, you're Michael. He still takes the other person in for the interview. And that's, the, the, that's what happens to you in this um, simulation. So how do we build a world where that's not happening? How do we build a world where the employers and the people in power are not leaving people invisible? This is what Mary Oliver has to say. On a summer morning, I sat down on a hillside to think about God, a worthy pastime. Near me, I saw a single cricket. It was moving the grains of the hillside this way and that way. How great was its energy, how humble its effort. Let us hope it will always be like this, each of us going on in our inexplicable ways, building the universe with great energy and
and humble efforts. The single cricket on the hillside is a builder of the universe. OK, let's just exercise a little poetic license and make it a chameleon. The chameleon <laughs> on the hillside is a builder of the universe. And if you learn today, and you adapt, and you grow, and you build a better version of yourself, I am, and you fill in the blank. If you do that, if you build the most authentic and beautiful version of yourself, there will be a better version of your class, and then there will be a better version of CA, and then there'll be a better version of the New England independent schools and so forth and so on. Just imagine what this school would be like if every single person were visible. Imagine what this school would be like if every single person were responsible, consistently responsible for the energy and the attitudes that you bring to class. What if you were consistently responsible for the way you treat people in your houses where many of you live and look a whole lot better at my cousin? What if you brought your best self to a drama or dance rehearsal, to an athletics practice or a game, to a club meeting? What if you turn up the volume right now, all of you who need to lead a workshop today, I'm going to be really good today. I'm going to be better than good today. What a beautiful sight to behold. So, no speed walking today. That means no one's going to be just going fast and going through the motions because you got to get to tonight. Go slowly. Adults in particular, walk more slowly today. Because maybe there's a teenager that's coming to tell you who they are. Maybe someone is going to share a story with you for the first time. So everyone, walk a little more slowly today. No speed walking. I know it's cold. But no speed walking. I was really busy on the day that a teenage boy knocked on my office door at the park school and told me who he was, who came out to me that day and said, Ms. Holland, Ms. Holland Green, I think that was Green at the time, or engaged. And he said, this school says that every member of the community has dignity. And if that is true, we should have a middle school GSA. I was really busy that day. But that boy is Peter Bosky. I am so proud of him. I cannot believe he's a grown up. <laughs> <laughs> so no speed walking because someone is coming to tell you their story. No sleepwalking today. Did I keep you awake, teens? Is that the measure of my success? <laughs> I hope you're still with me and still awake. My son David won't be awake until 4 p.m. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no sleepwalking. Eyes open, hearts open, ears open, arms open. That is what Dr. King would have wanted. Only power walking today. Walk with power. Walk with purpose to your workshops. Eat with people you don't know at lunch. And remember the two things I talked about today. If you truly want to build community, ensure that no person is invisible, if you want to create strong coalitions between diverse groups, cultivate empathy 
as a value and a skill. I believe in CA. I believe in its leaders. I believe in its teachers. I believe in its staff. I believe in its students on my worst day. Sometimes I close my eyes and say, those CA kids are gonna change the world. I believe in your mission. I love the new mission statement. It just went so perfectly with everything I wanted to say to you. Your mission beautifully aligns with Martin Luther King's dream. I believe that you will cultivate empathy, integrity, responsibility. I believe that you will build a more just and sustainable 